Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Product Led Podcast. Today, I, we're going to have a fun time. We're going to be going through this fun topic around user onboarding broccoli. It's the unsexy stuff. It's the not fun stuff. It's the foundational stuff that you need to think about whenever you're building a great onboarding experience. And so today I have Joshua and Trevor, who are the managing partners at Interact. And Interact really just helps companies really level up, improve their onboarding. And so they have been working a lot on this concept of building a user onboarding map. And so by the end of this episode, you'll actually be able to, we'll send you the link, you can go through it, uh, fill out your own tool. But we're gonna actually walk through like, why does this tool actually matter? Because there's a ton of onboarding tools out there, but um, why is this one super important? What are some of the elements of it? Uh, that really make it kind of stand out. So uh, Joshua and Trevor, welcome to the Product Led Podcast. Thanks, glad to be here. Yeah, thank you. So my first question is like, tell us the story. Like, how is this thing invented? Why? All the, all the fun details. Um, I'll, I'll get started on that one. So we've been working with B2B SaaS clients for the last uh, 10 years. And a huge part of what we do with them is bringing the teams aligned. So the sales and the product, and uh, dev, CX, to actually use the same vocabulary, have the same goals. And part of that was defining the customer's journey over the course of acquisition all the way through referral. And so uh, Trevor developed this sort of model around, you know, each, each stage of, of that has a KPI, has one person responsible for it, has... Um, definitions that that relate to it, and so this this tool that we'll talk about today is kind of the uh, culmination of of probably ten years worth of working with product leaders. Awesome! And can you just share um, a quick visual of like what this looks like uh, for the audience that is going to listen to this on YouTube? Uh, because yes, there is for anyone who's listening, we have a YouTube channel. <laughs> And not many people know about it, but uh, it's on product led, um, just the YouTube channel. So feel free to share the visual and we'll just kind of go through at a high level. What is on this user onboarding map that works? Yeah, sure. So this is an email marketing product. And as you can see, uh, it's kind of pulled from the pirate metrics, uh, although how you use this is a, is a bit different. And it's it's mainly uh, a team alignment tool, right? So. One of the biggest problems is just definitions through the customer journey. So acquisition and through activation or onboarding, uh, retention, re revenue, and referral. And by defining the core or key or actionable metrics within this uh, customer journey map and all of your teammates or core decision makers agree on it is the first step in, in getting things right. Awesome. And like I... I totally agree. Like team alignment, getting everybody on the same page is is a big uh, piece of this. Now, why did you choose like these three uh, different things? So like, there's the pirate metrics, there's the stage, and then there's the metrics. Like, what was it about those three things where you're like, yeah, this is the answer to alignment. It's going to help people quite a bit. So they they are kind of defined a little differently, um, but through the stages, um, let's say in acquisition, all of this is heavily defined based on um, this is kind of a grouped metric like sign up intent actually whereas onboarding is actual steps required steps to achieving the promise of your product um, for the first time so in an email marketing tool uh, it would be like sending your first email for instance in a campaign um, so there there it's actually there's a quite a bit behind how this works and there is uh, steps with questions for you to answer in order to get these outcomes that are very particular. So um, all of this kind of is a culmination of what's needed in order to define first. And then also there's a tracking element to this, right? So once these are defined, um, it's important to, to track these uh, properly. So both both sides of that coin are kind of in this map, and that's why there are these uh, multiple different areas, I suppose. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I also want to bring up a few cool things that this tool allows us to visualize. So un under the activation stage, there's a section called onboarding. And in, in this 
example, it has four steps. And, and, and these represent the technical requirements. You know, in, in this product, you actually do need to submit your account details in order to even send a campaign. So there's like these bare bones. Uh, uh, this is what in, in, in a lot of the sort of PLG modeling of onboarding is the absolutely required step inside the product to do. That's what this is supposed to represent. Um, and what's cool about this is that that last step, uh, the sending of the first email, um, can be directly correlated to the user's job to be done, right? And a good gauge of product market fit is to say, okay, this last technical step, it, it doesn't even look like what the headline on the company's website is, right? So, so maybe we have a product market fit problem. It, it allows us to quickly diagnose, is, is there really a, an onboarding problem here? Is there, uh, is there an activation problem? Is there an acquisition problem? Is it positioning? So that, that one piece there, that fourth step, really can tell us a lot about the, the client. Totally. Yeah. And I like it because it, it clearly outlines like, okay, if let's say the business isn't hitting its goals or something like that, it's like, okay, what is going on? And of course, if you have these metrics, you're actually tracking them. It would be a matter of just looking at like, okay, the stages are like there's visits, there's a sign up process, there's onboarding, there's goals, uh, engagement features, revenue, referral. It's like, well, actually two thirds of people get stuck in the onboarding. So like, let's let's dig in and oh, okay, there's four metrics here we got to track that like are the high level steps we uh, they need to go through. It's like they're getting stuck on two. It's like, it's, it just gives you that granular detail, which I love. Now, what are some of those like big problems if like a company doesn't have this? Like what is gonna go wrong <laughs> if a company doesn't have this? Yeah, it's so much, but I mean, we could have so many funny stories about this, but there's a few obvious ones in, in my head. And Trevor, you probably have other cool ones too. One is uh, when when companies don't really have this clearly defined up front strategically, um, we get into the, um, I want everyone to know all of my stuff and how cool I am syndrome. So so all of a sudden you've got hot spots on everything and you've got a walkthrough that takes you through 50 different paths and uh, and you're not actually optimizing for that happy path, the, 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 the bowling ball, of course, going down and having its first strike. So um, that's one thing that can happen without that strategy mapped up at, at the top of it. The other thing that comes to mind is this idea of, of cost of acquisition. I, I mean, after all, we're in SaaS. We're, we're in a subscription business model. And that means the cost of keeping, uh, converting and keeping somebody is, you know, way less expensive than the acquisition cost. And so the, really not having this up front can drive acquisition costs through the roof. I, I can add a little bit uh, to that. So I think from a from the, like the most high level areas here, without this being defined, you will have a misaligned team, right? And and aligned teams are teams that grow. If If people aren't on the same page, it's very difficult to grow together operationally between teams, et cetera, and generally have a rev ops problem there as well. Um, this gives everybody a clear picture that we all agree on as to what happens in our customer journey and what's most important. Um, that's laying some really, really important foundations. Without it, it's very difficult to, 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 to be aligned. Another very common thing I've seen is you'd be surprised, but those required steps for people to achieve an onboarded state or activated state oftentimes aren't even tracked because they're not defined. They get overlooked. Sometimes the most obvious metrics get overlooked from even being tracked. And how are you supposed to improve it if it's not even being tracked or it's not even uh, on the radar? So, you know, ha not having clarity to improve onboarding on top of that whole thing without laying these foundations, um, how are you supposed to be successful, right? So, it, it all starts from laying these like initial foundations as a team so that you can track, so that you can do some tests, so that you can then optimize. That's a starting point there. Totally. And I know one of the first questions we kind of like scoped out for this, <laughs> you guys did, was it's like, where does user onboarding start? Because I think there's a lot of like, I don't know, myths around that one. So can you guys just explain like, where does that kind of begin and end? Uh, or if it ends? <laughs> Yeah, um, I kind of have a, I don't know if it's a controversial view about it, but maybe an unconventional one, which is it, it starts as soon as you make contact 
with the customer and ends the moment they fire your product. So user onboarding is perpetual. And, and it's almost like every single one of those pirate metric stages um, can be defined as a, um, a, a unique place in the user onboarding story. So, so acquisition is you know, really culminating in the creation of the account. Activation is the culmination of that promised first value. Um, and all the way through, you know, revenues, that's the obvious one. They give you some money. Um, and then, you know, of course, retention, uh, they stick around and, and do like the, the, the depth and the breadth of, of staying engaged with your product. I think I, th- I think I could maybe like give a simple, a simple like I think what we're, tra- what we're trying to do here is define user onboarding, right, as well, which is, you know, it's it's the journey a new user takes while looking to experience the promise of your business or your product for the first time. And I think that's important too. A, a lot of times people get um, the for the first time mixed up because of, let's say, North Star metric definitions and things. And we could talk about that a little bit, but it should be for the first time. That way it's definitive across the board. And I also want to like make sure I, we do a shout out to Inner Trends, which is also the product we we looked at the customer journey map, which we, we work very closely with on, on this as well. Um, so I don't want to leave them out. And a lot of the language we use is aligned as well, such as like the, achieving the, the promise of your business or your product. I think that's important to to understand. And we can probably talk a little bit about that too. Awesome. Totally. So I'm just curious, if wanna, or maybe I under, misunderstood here too, but whenever you say like user onboarding is just for like that first time kind of like experience, um, what do you kind of mean by that? Just like the first time they log in or like the second time they log in, are they not considered like still under user onboarding or how does that work in your mind? Yeah, sure. I can take that. So for the first time is related to the promise of your, your product or your business, right? Let's take a, uh, again, we can do email marketing software since we're on that topic, right? We said onboarded state is sent the first email in, in a campaign. It's the first time that you experience the promise of what an email marketing software would do is in sending emails. Now, that may uh, you may in that journey not have achieved that in the first time you've logged in, but those defined uh, onboarding steps are what we're tracking as a required step to achieving that promise. And so they may it may take them five times to log in and it may take them two weeks. Um, but we're looking at the first time they understand what this, you know, the problem that this business is solving for them. The promise is what we're calling it, if that makes sense. OK, so then what would you kind of call it? Like I know we're getting into the, uh, <laughs> the specific minutia here. <laughs> so like after they finish the, the kind of like promise, they fulfill that part. They're like, I get it. Is it still user onboarding or is it like, I don't know, because they, there's kind of that middle zone I see it now where it's like, it's not quite customer onboarding since they haven't paid yet, but how do you kind of define that? Let's look back at the, the map for just a second, right? So what we have after they, this would be considered onboarded as defined and agreed on as, as a team. What happens afterwards are goals. So this may be sent the second email campaign or third or fifth. Um, obviously upgraded to paid is a, is a goal if you're on a free trial at this point, right? Now, what we look at is they've experienced the promise at this point. We understand that if they've gone through this and something is wrong, then there's drop off somewhere. And this is a, a very clear area for us to optimize. Over here is what we're looking at for more of an engagement or retention aspect to this. And, or you could talk about, let's say, a, a customer defined North Star metric if you want to go this deeper into this, right? So if somebody, ha- if you had a time metric to this, um, how many times it takes them to do something, do onboarded state, you know, two times, three times, five times within a period of time that leads to the highest uh, retention or engagement. That's much more what we look at as a customer defined North Star metric. And that would be like the goal of a team. But it is not the same as onboarded, if that makes sense. Yes. And one of the the side reasons I wanted to dig into this is because even though I'd argue we do a lot of the same things like you 
uh, help companies like implement and improve their onboarding. We kind of like train teams on, you know, how to like think about their onboarding, PLG, how does it all fit together? What's important is that your team is on the same page because we both describe things different ways. We both use different language. So onboarding to you might mean something a bit different and it actually doesn't matter. <laughs> what matters is like your team's on the same page. You all know what the heck it is. You know what you're driving towards. And that's why back to having a map or some kind of visual of it all is like, that's the sauce. That's the broccoli we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. That uh, it matters. So, yeah, um, less about the the minutia, more about just uh, get everyone on the same page. I wanted to come back to something you said briefly, Wes, which was the difference between user versus customer onboarding, because uh, our definitions of this might also be different from the way you see it. And and this is the distinction we make is is really kind of around product led versus more uh, combination business models where, where the way we see user onboarding is freemium or a free trial, where it's very product driven. Most of it can be automated. Where we see customer onboarding is taking, taking, um, taking a role when there's a more complex onboarding experience. For example, if, if you sell a, an AI tool that requires two years worth of data to be processed and the data has to be arranged in a certain way and um, and it takes weeks to run the algorithm. There's really, and, and a human being actually has to kind of handhold that that customer's experience. Typically, this is more like enterprise. That's kind of what we refer to as customer onboarding because you're you're doing less automation and you're doing more project ma management um, to get to that that activated state or that that promised value. I think, like just to add, like make it very simple, it's generally because they become a customer before they experience the promise of the product, right? They pay based on a promise, but then they have to get onboarded to, to achieve that promise post-payment, hence customer. A user is generally trying to upgrade to become a customer in that journey, right? Yeah, uh, definitely like that uh, simple kind of dis distinction. And then what would you say like the role of like this user onboarding journey map is? Like, where do you use it? How do you kind of like follow it? We talked about like uh, kind of mapping it out and all those steps, but is it just kind of like something you set it, forget it, or like how do you kind of use it? How do you implement it? How, what's your kind of like take on how do you approach it? Yeah, um, so it, it's a great operating tool too. Like it's not just a set it, set it up once, mm -hmm. set up your emails and your in-app walkthroughs and walk away from it kind of deal. It's um, it actually can be driven into a kind of culture of data, a culture of collaboration and, and, and alignment. So we, we often um, ask our clients to participate in a scorecard exercise and it's a manual one. Uh, we, we assign a, um, a metric to an actual stakeholder to be responsible for it. Mm -hmm. And they manually actually have to put their number in, which kind of drives um, a sense of responsibility for, for that number. And depending on the velocity of data, that could be a weekly or monthly call where that, that RevOps team gets together over time, sees, uh, sees that scorecard grow, shift, turn more red, turn more green, um, and, and sort of make those incremental changes that, um, again, are kind of like the broccoli. Like we all want that silver bullet. Mm -hmm. We want to just do, redo all of our emails and all of a sudden our, our user onboarding doubles. Uh, but oftentimes it's, it's not like that. It's, 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 it's a slog and you're taking one email or one UX experience and tweaking it and testing it and seeing how that affects everything else over time. So we, we do have a, um, a template that we use with our clients for, for that kind of scorecarding exercise. Okay. And I know for like the uh, user journey map, there's like probably about like 30 different metrics. And I was just thinking <laughs> for myself, I remember the first company scorecard I built. <laughs> it had way too much stuff in it. I was just like, okay, so we're paying attention to everything. We're also missing the mark on so many things. So like, how do you make it simple uh, so that like people actually like pay attention to it and can understand those numbers? Obviously it's got to be tracked somewhere, but um, what about just like having a higher level kind of like team scorecard to keep people like on track? 
Well, there's this this pill you could take. It's called the uh, Simplicity Pill. I'll take it in the morning yeah, with yeah. your vitamin C. <laughs> Can you get me that one? <laughs> <laughs> we could. Uh, so, like, the idea here is you take one metric from each of uh, maybe not one metric, but the the core metrics from from each of these uh, pillars, right? We call them at Interact. We call them growth pillars: uh, acquisition, activation revenue retention referral, we're calling them growth pillars. And you would take the core metrics from each of these. So call it visits, each of your onboarding steps, upgraded to paid, right? And then you may track all of these other uh, goals, retention metrics, et cetera. And, and some of those may, you may see them pop in and out of the scorecard based on opportunity, right? And you agree as a team, which ones of these are going to lead to, to growth or a test you're doing or something to that effect, right? So yeah, of course, simplify it down. You're tracking these because there's you believe that there's defined opportunities in them, and um, that's those ones that you you find once tracking is in place to have an opportunity you may add to the scorecard and assign that metric to to a team member. Um, I don't know, Joshua, do you have a scorecard template we could show? Yeah, I could show one real quick. Yeah, simple one. So we're just tracking. Um, obviously, their product is a lot more complicated than this, <laughs> um, and this is color coded. So these are acquisition metrics, these are activation metrics, this is the revenue metric, um, and these are the ones that we've assigned. So um, you know, we were hired to do their uh, inbound work, so we kind of owned this top part. Their product person owned this part. Their sales person owns this part. Their CX owns the uh, retention part. Can I just jump in here? Yeah. So having ownership, hugely underrated. Yeah. <laughs> hugely helpful uh, for any of these scorecards. So, yeah. It, yeah. And it's not about blame, too. I mean, that's the other thing is people get afraid. Like, don't blame me if the number goes down. No, it's okay. Like, it's not your fault. Google changed their algorithm. <laughs> Or the Sierra assigned you 10 of them. <laughs> like, this is too unrealistic, too. And there are nuances to this, like this is uh, a seasonal product, right? So there's going to be fluctuations in, in the year and different things that the team knows about and you can add comments and, um, but, but like it doesn't, the, a lot of this stuff is, it doesn't have to be perfect to be effective, right? Um, just do it <laughs> and you'll, and you'll start to adapt your own ways sometime. And so like when you build this out, is there anything like I'm thinking of two problems of like people actually implementing this one, like updating this, like, is this like, I don't know, VAs or automated way of doing this to get like all this data review it? And like, what kind of cadence do you typically find works best for reviewing this? This particular client is in a monthly cadence. They're more of an enterprise sale. They close, you know, 10 to 15 deals a month. They're not in the hundreds of new users realm. Products with a higher velocity, you will probably want to do this monthly, uh, sorry, weekly. As far as automating it, I do get that question a lot. And I actually, it's kind of like, you, you know, using a pen and paper sometimes, the medium is itself a good strategy. And having people not automate this, but actually take the time to look at their data and make that a habit is really important. If it was just automated, and there are ways to automate this, Databox has tools that can build scorecards and you, they just send you the email of your scorecard. Well, you've kind of stolen the opportunity to swim in your, in your product, in your customer. And um, I, I really like the idea of just put, put a recur recurring event in your calendar make it a half an hour and spend some time looking at your numbers because a lot of times you see things the serendipity is is yeah, is allowed to to show up sometimes um that's that's sort of my my woo woo answer to to your question on that no i i totally dig it because it's like we we use data box <laughs> And like I've set it up so like our core metrics, like it just gets pinged in Slack every day. But like it is to your point, like it's easy to ignore because it's like, oh, OK, I know in the growth channel, whatever, we get pings. And it's like, I know I could check it, but and it is easy to check it. But then it's like, well, there's other numbers there. If something's off track, then it's a great opportunity to kind of dig into that, find out like what are some of those things and uh, create more of like 
yeah, okay, we're doing the inputs, but we're also looking into the all the other outputs. And I think that's actually um, a really great connection there between there's a scorecard and then it's like, well, it's going back to that customer journey map. Oh, okay, that top level metrics off, like let's dig through those other five or eight metrics that were a part of that and see what else we could uncover because maybe it's not this problem. Uh, and maybe it's something else above it that's really like, oh, our users were down or something like that. That's like, that's why we don't have as many signups this month. I'm blaming marketing. Yes, <laughs> right. And, but, but blame them to their face, right? Don't just like yeah. do that. Pick it up already. <laughs> um, just, just to give you a concrete example, we had a client who had a CX, let's see, we were involved with CX dev and products sort of with their growth. And something happened. And because we had this meeting and it was a data meeting with the leaders in the RevOps team, we were very quickly able to make better onboarding decisions because CX was in there, looked at a huge spike in problems. And we're trying to talk about how to improve the, the uh, UX of, of that first 30 seconds in that product. Her insight in, in, in this event that happened was pivotal in making really good in-product decisions. Um, and that wouldn't have happened without this, this uh, scorecard to facilitate that conversation. Totally. Speaking of like examples too, could you give us an example of like from beginning to end to kind of wrap this up as far as like, so there's a company, let's say you, they approached you and they're like, okay, we're a little lost as far as onboarding. Like we need some help. We need to like kind of map this out. Take us from that end to like, you, how did you go about mapping it out to tracking it and how that kind of changed that company? So, you know, I, I, I want to say one thing before I give the example based on the la last conversation we had, which is if you're to the point where you're, you're defined your metrics, they are tracked and you are having a scorecard in meetings, you're like, 95% ahead of the game, right? I would say that's a, that just that in itself is is a is a is the foundations for starting improvements, and that's not going to say it, in general that it's easy to get there. Um, the tracking gap is a big one, but if you have them defined, you can know how to track them, and it doesn't really matter really where you do it. So that being said, to the story, I'll stick to the email marketing software. In fact, the one we're looking at, the map in this podcast, in this example. So ultimately, when when we worked with them, the teams were very disconnected. Uh, so we started with definitions, right? Um, as these were defined, tracking starts to get in place. That is, there is a, a gap there that takes a bit of, of time. And note that you have to look at or give it time based on how much data you have to, to have that data roll in to make decisions, right? Unless you can, you know, plug in a snowflake or something and look at back data or something. But we were able to then implement a scorecard, have a weekly team meeting, and start to understand where drop-off is occurring, particularly in onboarding. Now, we have our required steps to find. And on top of that, we have an experience layer, right? So you're looking at the drop-off from the steps from an analytical point of view, but you're building experience based on where that drop-off is. So they're really disconnected. The two are uh, are not one and the same. What we noticed was between creating a campaign, the first email campaign to send, and sending your first campaign, as we defined as onboarded uh, earlier, there was a common action of going back into the product and adding contacts. Adding contacts actually isn't required because as you create your account, you are a contact and you can actually send a test to yourself. But for some reason, there was an experience that people felt when they started to create a campaign, they needed to go back into contacts, upload their list or add additional contacts. And it was creating this bump in the experience or friction for them to achieve onboard or send that first campaign. We actually did a really quick down and dirty sort of walkthrough when people came through to, to encourage them to add contacts prior to uh, going into creating their campaign. And that's really where we saw a conversion boost. It was a few percentage points, but it was obvious. And the small, I think the point is small tests like that can be implemented. And then you can go into the product and improve it or, or however you want. But we would never have been able to see even that 
for improvement without these foundational areas in place. Awesome. And so if a company is like considering like, okay, I'm like ready, I'm sold, let's let's go in and do this. What's your quick like action plan for them to actually build out their own kind of user journey map? Yeah, so we we spin up ours on actionablemetrics.com. You can go there, that the map's available. Um, you just fill it out, you get your own map. Um, that will give you your de- definitions as a team. We'll supply a, a scorecard template in this if you, if you want to leverage that off of that. And then off of that, it's it's really a, a, a team effort to get the tracking in place. That's going to be your gap to fill as a team um, to shoot for. And then once you have that in place, like work on a, a team meeting to, to look at these numbers. That's really what, what where your starting points are. Maybe anything to add to that, Joshua? Yeah, I would. I would, I would add um, even bringing the team together earlier. Uh, so, sometimes it's nice to have everybody represented. You get sales, products, um, marketing, CX, kind of all in a room, and then doing the map together. Or, or I've seen people do them separately and then compare, which is interesting to see, like how sales sees things very differently from Dev, DevOps, and and put those together into a centralized version of that map. Either way, the way we like to work with people is they can do it as a team or separately or combined um, and then go back as sort of consultants and spend a half an hour and say, okay, so are those really the most important technical steps? Can we take one out? Did you miss any? Really defining what those goals are, which are going to be hypothesis at first for now. I think that's a good point, though. Like, you're not trying to be perfect. And I think that's what a lot of people try to do right now to get off the ground, right? Just agree, get off the ground and you can optimize and, and refine and change things as you learn um, when the data comes in, right? So don't worry about being perfect. I think that's really important. Got another way of saying that. Uh, Jacqueline Cook launched like the, went from sales led to product led at this company called Medasta. And she was like going through in our program, like he, how like did this whole process work? What are like some advice? And she's like... <laughs> Your baby will be ugly. <laughs> Just accept it. Yeah. It's like, it's fine. It's, okay. it's better to learn like what are some of those problems in your product because like you're not, even if you try, you're not going to nail it. And actually, if you wait too long, you're actually going to learn a lot less than you would have if you just launched it. So it's like, yeah, really just get it to like the, the V1 version and then you can always improve it based on some of those data or like you find out, okay, now we can track these things and let's add that back in um, now that we have that capability. So I love it. That's a tip you had, Joshua, regarding getting the team to actually do the mapping exercise. Uh, 100% agree. Like I've found that we found that for our program too. That's one of the things where it's like we initially start our program off with like individuals. And then we started to realize like, oh, we're actually missing the point. Our training is not about training. <laughs> it's about alignment. It was like this big aha. I was like, ah, this makes sense in hindsight because it's like when you do this as a group and you actually go through these things, it's like, well, we have just solved one of the hardest things in any organizational change is like getting buy-in. How do we get everybody bought into this? How do we get them like, oh, I care about this metric now because I know why it's important kind of thing. And so... Um, it's a subtle, important hack. So I love it. Um, thank you so much for for coming on and kind of breaking down how to go through and build your user journey map. And uh, it's the broccoli, it's the foundation, it's all that fun stuff. Um, any other last words of advice you kind of give people? Uh, there, there's something I like to say to people, which is uh, onboarding is not about teaching your users how to use your product. It's about helping your users achieve their goals. Love it. That is nice, firm, crisp. Perfect way to end this. Uh, <laughs> where can people learn more about you guys and what you're up to? Interact.com is a good place to start. And uh, LinkedIn, we're both on LinkedIn and hosting there. Yeah, we'll link the uh, customer journey map as well as the team scorecard template. But thank you so much, guys, for, for coming on. Thank you. Thank you.